are back here for another episode of Beyond the Whistle. It's a special one, too. It's episode 13. We're climbing up in the numbers. And we have a special one for you today. It's the UFC 249 review. Live sports is back. And we are here to give you our analysis. Ian Nicholas with us, of course. I'm Dylan Pescator. And now we have our mixed martial artist and combat sports analyst, Harvey Duplock, with us today. Harvey, thank you for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you guys for having me. I can't wait to share some of my wisdom with you guys. And I can't be happier that you two are finally tuning into the sport because, man, isn't MMA just amazing? We learned that last night. We tuned in. Ian and I were on a phone call. Thank goodness uh, technology is like that today that we could give our comments back and forth. Uh, we actually made picks too, but we're not going to give those picks out because, honestly, I only won one of them out of the five <laughs> on the main cards. I got to admit it. But before we get right into the fights, we're going to talk about the pandemic and how it affected UFC. Harvey, you have news with that. Yeah, so the UFC, they are doing as much as they can to still be able to do an amazing show, but also prevent the spread of coronavirus. Everyone is being tested multiple, multiple times. I know Joe Rogan, he's gone on to say that he was tested three times prior to the event, antibody testing and the normal nose swab testing that you do get. But I know you're going to talk about uh, more of the results for that uh, later, Dylan. I will also say that, that everyone was spread apart. You had no audience. You commentated on the other side of the ring. The moment you lost or won you were taken to a separate area to do your interview so they were trying to keep people as separate as they could but what they did do was something that we've never really seen before was they had they forced everyone that showed up to sign a non-disparagement agreement basically what this was was no one who showed up so fighters personnel was able to lie about the coronavirus testing You were able to speak against it. You could say it wasn't what you think it should have been. You could say you weren't, you didn't feel safe, but what you can't say, you can't make up lies practically. If you lie, if you say you weren't tested, if you say you were shoved next to someone instead of, you know, six feet apart, you will get your uh, purse taken away if you win. And if you didn't win, you will see some other um, money taken away from your paycheck. So they really are just trying to make UFC seem as great as possible in these times. And thank goodness that all the fighters did pass, except one, Ronaldo Souza, a fighter on the prelim card, did test positive. His fight was canceled, and uh, him and two of his uh, ring personnel did test positive for the virus, so his fight was canceled. UFC did a great job of acting on that after the results came in on that Friday, two days before the event, or one day before the event, actually, Saturday night, Saturday, Sunday night. Who knows the days at this point, honestly? <laughs> uh, so I'm looking at my phone for the calendar for the days now. Anyways, um... Let's go right into the fighting, but before we get right into the fights and to the first fight with Hardy and uh, his opponent, we're going to talk about a Hall of Fame announcement that happened in the middle of the pay-per-view last night. George St. Pierre, a UFC legend, has now been announced to the Hall of Fame of UFC. Harvey, just talk about his career and how great he really was. GSP is generally considered to be one of the best ever, no matter of the weight class. He was a two weight class uh, division kind of guy. So he was able to go up and down whenever he felt like he was just a dominant beast. He'd only ever lost, I think, twice in his career. He went out on top. He truly just was so dominant. He really was a no brainer. If you could pick anyone to go into UFC Hall of Fame, he was 100% the guy that you would put in. You know, when the promotion was first coming up in, you know, in the early well, in the 90s and then in the noughties, you know, around 2008, 2009, he was the one that really put UFC from a disgraced sport into what it is now today. He was a brand ambassador. I know he had a, you know, he sometimes had his fallings out with Dana White, but literally every single fighter in the UFC has their falling out with Dana White. So he really was deserving of this Hall of Fame. It really should have come sooner, probably back when, you know, like Ronda Rousey or someone was inducted. Uh, he, he really did deserve it. Absolute beast. Dominant career, you know, former champion, uh, one of the best that we've ever seen, one of the best that we ever will see, will, will see, I should say, uh, very, very, very deserving. I mean, he has a great career. And really, before I started following UFC lightly with McGregor and when he fought Diaz, George St. Pierre was the name I thought of when people say UFC. So it was a great announcement for him to get in that Hall of Fame. And now let's get to the fight in the main cards. First fight was Jorgen DeCastro versus former NFL player Greg Hardy. Ian, I know you used to play football. You still follow it now. Give me your thoughts on what you saw through the three-round fight. Well, Dylan, we always joke, but I love to sneak football references into everything in every sport I cover, which is probably a bad thing for the viewers. But, hey, it's the perfect opportunity to use one here. 
I mean, people forget just how good Hardy was in the NFL. He has a Carolina Panther sack leader or the most sacks in a single season still with 15 back in 2013. He was a pro bowler. He had massive off the field problems though. And two years ago, he switched to the UFC and he's been really, really good. And, you know, this fight was a little bit wonky. You know, he did win by decision. This was the first win of his career uh, by decision. All previous of his five wins had been by knockout. So he went three rounds um, with the Castro. And it was a little bit bizarre because a lot of people thought that the Castro broke his foot uh, in the middle after uh, one of the uh, leg kicks from Hardy went short. So obviously, I mean, you break your foot, you're, you're not going to be in a fight at all. You break anything, you're not going to be in a fight at all. So uh, it was a little bit interesting because a lot of the judges, or it seems like the three judges seemed that it, uh, De Castro just let this one slip away from him because he came out strong in the first round. He was looking good. He was looking in control over Hardy. But as the fight wore on, he just gave it away to a former NFL All-Pro. So shout out to Greg Hardy for reviving his pro sports career in a completely different sport. I mean, that's obviously insane to go from the NFL to the UFC in just three years. But, you know, he's now 6-2, and two, and he continues to rise up the ranks two years into his career. Absolutely. You know, I tuned in uh, at the start of round one, of course. And then really in that round two, when that kick was missed, DeCastro didn't seem the same. He was moving around. He wasn't really – he didn't really have any motivation to beat Hardy. It seemed like he was just trying to stay alive in the ring as he went through a foot injury. Harvey, what did you see through this three-round bat- bout? Yeah, so I, I personally thought De Castro won the first round. Not by, uh, not by much, you know, probably around 10 to 9 if you're going to score it. But when it came into the second round, after that missed leg kick, he just stopped everything. He really was not putting in a fight. From, from there on, it wasn't an enjoyable fight, in my opinion. Uh, it, you know, um, Greg Hardy just absolutely was taking advantage of it, and he came out with a win. Uh, I'm not shocked by that at all. Um, but then also, I think one thing to note is Greg Hardy was really actually – adapting to his surroundings and his circumstances uh, of course there's no fans but what that made him able to do was able to listen to a his coach and also the commentators you had Dan- Daniel Cormier one of the greatest um, mixed martial arts and uh, grappling minds out there and uh, you know two division champion he's an absolute beast he was on commentary that night and uh, Hardy said that He was not aware that he should be checking leg kicks until Daniel Cormier said it on commentary. This is someone who's been a pro fighter for a long time, you know, getting into it. And he just learned, you know, he's had his crew. He's really, you know, your crew is supposed to tell you that kind of stuff. And he learned that from the commentator. So he was really able to adapt and come out with the win, um, which was great for him. I mean, he was using it as environment. It was great to see because, you know, in sports, we always call for more moments mic'd up. Pretty much it was mic'd up without any fans. You know, you heard the coaches uh, telling the fighters advice throughout the whole night. And Ian, you wanted to touch on that as well. Well, totally. I mean, to, pi- to piggyback off of what Harv said, um, in the Jeff Wagenheim article from ESPN, I mean, we heard really what this night was all about without any fans. We heard every shot land. We heard coaches trying to get a little bit extra out of their fighters. We heard the commentators acting as fans with the oohs and ahs. But imagine, you know, a color commentator cannot be heard in any stadium, in any sport, by any fighter or professional athlete. I mean, imagine if Troy Aikman was covering a Dallas Cowboys game and Dak Prescott could hear him and, you know, he could take that advice mid-game from a Hall of Famer. And now you got this color commentator, one of the best in the sport, as Harvey mentioned, and Hardy smart enough to pick up the knowledge mid-game and adjust his strategy. So even though he was fighting against an injured fighter, potentially, who broke his foot, I mean, hey, if I could hear my coach that clearly in a professional bout, I'm taking every piece of advice. Shout out to Greg Hardy for, you know, not blocking out the limited noise that was there, but to use it, as you mentioned, Dylan, to his full advantage, make himself better mid-fight. And we'll see how maybe uh, that goes on in the future uh, as UFC in the coming weeks continues their fights if the commentators still play a vital role to fighters' success. Yeah, you know, Greg Hardy... Greg Hardy was a young fighter. He's a young fighter. He's young in his career. To be able to show that wits and that smarts, being able to adapt to his surroundings, he's got an amazing career ahead of him. I can't wait to see where he goes. Hardy now moves to 6-2, and two, and now we'll go to the second fight on the night. It was Jeremy Stevens versus Calvin Cater, and really it was a great bout. First round, Stevens, I felt one, Ian. You know, we talked about how Stevens is a little bit smaller than Cater, but he kept checking those legs, and he kept beating down Cater's legs. But after that round one uh, win by Stevens, Cater just took over. Ian, your thoughts? 
Yeah, totally. I mean, Stevens looked in control definitely after round one and even into round two. Uh, but then that epic elbow, which, uh, which uh, you know, there was the massive gruesome gash after that. And sometimes that's just how a contact sports go. You know, I mean, I know I've watched really a lot of it. But from what I could tell in this fight, a guy can be dominating the entirety of the fight. And then one blow can really change it all if, you know, it's a perfect blow in a sense. I mean, Cater was getting a little bit hot before that epic elbow. But really, that just put uh, the man known as Will Heaven away. So, you know, shout out to Cater for getting this win. He was the slight underdog. as the, uh, He was eighth ranked and, and Stevens was seventh. But, I mean, it just shows you that, you know, a fighter is one big blow away from taking not only the momentum. I mean, momentum is massive in sports, but really just taking the fight away with it in round two. And Cater looked good. I mean, he had that elbow working right after that round one. We talked about making adjustments. Maybe he felt better now without fans yelling in his face between uh, rounds as his coaches were talking to him, mm -hmm. saying, you got to start using your hands. you got to use that elbow. And that elbow worked to his, his advantage. Harvey, your thoughts on the bout? Uh, you know, I thought, you know, I thought Stevens did win the first round. I think we all did. But it should be noted, Stevens did come in underweight by four yeah. and a half pounds. He missed the weight, which means he was lighter. But it also means uh, crater, uh, Qatar, his opponent, had, had the more powerful blows. You know, he, he was able to have more weight behind him. That showed when he was able to hit that uh, elbow and bust him open. Ian, you were saying how, yes, one person can be winning the whole entire fight, and then all of a sudden, just like that, they are done. That is the beauty of combat sports. Um, this really reminds me of Alistair Overeem's last fight versus someone who was seen on this card, Rosenstrike. Um, Alistair Overeem was would have won by decision. He was absolutely just winning the fight. And out of nowhere, Rosenstrike hit uh, over Reem and just completely tore open his mm -hmm. teeth. You could see his teeth. Uh, you know, he pretty much had to get it reattached to his face. That was the fight over. So, yeah, fights like this can end in a second um, by the person that was losing at the time. That's the beauty of UFC. And Cater just let that elbow go. And it was over by then once Steven started to bleed. It was pretty much over, and the referee had to step in. Cater is really moving up those ranks in his division. He's now eight, but now he's going to move up, of course, with this win over Stevens. And uh, now he moves to 21-4 and four on his career. And now we're going to move to the next fight of the night. It was one of my favorites, honestly. We always like to see football players and how big they are and just in the trenches. Ian, I know you're an offensive line expert. But Francis Nagano versus Rosenstrike, as you said, you mentioned his fight before. It was a bout of heavyweights, and it did not disappoint. Ian, what were your thoughts? Well, just to sum up why I loved Francis Nagano, even though I had no idea really who he was heading into this fight, was in the pregame, not the pregame, the pre-match, I should say, they had the guys in the locker rooms. And obviously, that was a big, that was a more important shot in this show because there were no fans to see. So this was one of the more interesting shots to pay attention to was how they were getting amped up, how they were getting in their head space and their mental space pre-fight in the locker room. And when I saw Nagano, I mean, this guy was a Greek god. I mean, he was just built. I mean, we compared him to Khalil Mack. He's bigger than Khalil Mack. I mean, he was 6'4", 260, big arms. I mean, tree trunks for arms. This guy just looked he like he was going to win. I did not I didn't need I didn't need to see Rosen strike. I didn't need to see his 10 and 0 record before the fight to know this fight was over just based on this guy's size and this guy's demeanor pre-fight. Did I think it was going to end in 20 seconds? No. I mean, I yeah, I just didn't know that was possible to be honest. I mean, it was insane how this fight was over as we mentioned in a snap. But I mean, sometimes you just know looking at an athlete, you know, and just looking at their demeanor pre-fight that it was over before it really began here. I mean, Ugano just looked so dominant uh, through those 20 seconds. And or we just talk about his career and how he's gotten to now the three seed, and then we'll talk about his, uh, his next fight. Okay, so Francis Ngannou, he is just an absolutely insane athlete. So he's lost twice in the UFC, and after those two losses, he really just honed in on his craft, and he came back better than ever. I mean, this is he's always been a beast, but this is a man that beats Cain Velasquez in 26 seconds. Put Cain Velasquez into retirement. After Cain got beat like that, he's run off to the squared circle to give pro uh, professional wrestling a go. Francis Ngannou beat him out of the UFC. It was absolutely insane. Ngannou, he is just beast. He's four rounds, first round, uh, four, um, four consecutive first round knockout wins. 
you know, he's so insane. He's only ever lost three times in his career. Uh, he's 100% going to be, you know, that has to be the, one of the next challengers to the um, championship. He is so insane. This fight really reminded me of the um, shortest fight in UFC history, Ben Askren versus Jorge Masvidal, um, because, you know, you were going in expecting a much better fight than what you got. And it was just over instantly. Um, Nganu, real, uh, I mean, um, uh, Rosenstrike really did not, uh, you know, have a chance against that fight. And Rosenstrike is an amazing athlete himself. You know, people like Joe Rogan, who's a commentator, you know, for UFC and analyst, an analysis, he generally thought Rosenstrike actually had a chance against um, uh, Nganu, but obviously that wasn't the case. Uh, and, you know, to show how great um, Rosenstrike was, he was the one that beat um, uh, Alistair Overeem and just tore his mouth right open. Uh, you know, that just goes to show how great he was and even better Nganu is. I mean, it was power going back and forth and right there it was one hit from Nganu, then he missed on a few punches, got him against the, uh, the fence and it was all over from there. Uh, Ian, what did you see from Rosenstrike that really, he didn't get it going. I mean, he's the one who called out Nganu for this fight. And what you know, can only last 20 seconds in the ring. I mean, you, you have to be able to back up what you say pre-fight. I mean, you know, I mean, especially in a sport where all the pre-hype drama is one of its biggest strengths and one of its biggest advertisers, you know, you have to be able to back it up by more than 20 seconds in the ring. I mean, Nganu missed his first three, four hits. I mean, it looked like he nailed all of them because he was just viciously going after him, bang, bang, bang. But he only needed one to put him on the ground, and then he obviously, the barrage ended the fight. But then I love Nganu. I mean, you know, he's a guy who's pr a lot of pride, a lot of power. I mean, he's won a lot of big bouts, as Harvey mentioned. He deserves to have a lot of pride. And afterward, you know, I love this quote from him. He said, uh, after the fight, he has a lot of potential, but I think he has to take a step back. He just checked Rosenstrike and said, hey, you had a 10-0 record. You've had your fair share of shine, but I've been in UFC a little bit longer. I've been around. You know, you got to learn your place sometime and just let the fight happen instead of calling out guys. And I just love how he put him in his place. I mean, literally put him in his place, you know, 20 seconds in. But after the fight, you know, just checking Rosenstrike. Rosenstrike, hopefully he's going to come back better than ever when we see him next. But, uh, you know, this was definitely a big uh, downward, not a downward trend in his career, but, you know, definitely something Rosenstrike is going to have to come back from in a big way. Speaking of next fights, I mean, they talked about it on the uh, commentary a lot. Where does Nagano go from here? Harvey, we know that uh, Miacic and Cormier are supposed to fight, and Cormier says he's retiring after the fight. They're now 1-1 in their rivalry, and now it's supposed to be the, the best of three matchup. Where does Nagano go from here? He definitely deserves a championship shot. Am I wrong? No, you, you are 100% correct. Nganu does deserve a shot more than anyone. I think once uh, Cormier is done with that fight and retires, if he's not the champion, if he doesn't retire as champion, and if Stipe wins and is the champion, I think that's a matchup right there. And what a matchup that is. Stipe Miocic versus Francis Nganu. I mean, I'm just salivating thinking about that fight. That is just, that's a dream match right there. I mean, I, that. That will that buy rate uh, record shattered right there. That is an insane fight. That um, people look forward to that fight more than they looked forward to this fight that just ended in 20 seconds. It was two big boys going back and forth. Now we're going to go a little bit of the smaller guys. It's Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz. And Ian, Dominic Cruz hadn't fight, fought in four years. He comes back and now he's fighting Triple C, a guy who was called the third best pound for pound fighter by ESPN before this event. What did you see from Cruz? Well, this was the co-main event of the night, even though the, the last one, obviously, you know, was the really the main event. But this was definitely big. It was the World Bantamweight Championship. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I had no idea that Dominic Cruz, who's 35 years old, hadn't fought in 1,200 days, pretty much four years before this fight. I wouldn't have picked him to win if I knew that. I mean, he's a future Hall of Famer, as the commentators mentioned from his career, a storied career. But four years out of any sport, you know, you're not going to come back the same. And he was in this fight. He definitely put up a good fight. It was a good back and forth. And the way it ended was a bit controversial, you know. Was he trying to get back up after uh, a good couple shots, a lot of cont uncontested shots from Cahuto? And, you know, he was trying to work his way back up, and the ref called it off, even though he was conscious. 
But, you know, Dylan and I, after we looked at it a second time, we said, I mean, it was just too much of a blow for blow from Triple C. I mean, the fight was over. He had earned himself that victory, even though we weren't a big fan of his personality. But, you know, he ended it. He retired after the fight, even though Harvey said, you know, this is a guy who probably could be coming back just based on him, his personality, and his love for money in previous quotes. I mean, who doesn't love money? So we'll see, you know, where his career goes from here, Cahuto, that is. But, you know, Cruz looked good considering he was four years out of fighting, you know, against premier competition. He looked very solid, but just not enough. He just didn't provide enough offense to back up, you know, Cahuto's attack. And Triple C was all over him. You know, they counted 11 unanswered shots before they called the fight off. If you can't stop one of those 11, I mean, it's a fair call to call the fight off and have the referee step in. And uh, Cruz said today he was – he wasn't very happy with the stoppage at the time. You know, he was talking to Dana White. He was talking to Joe Rogan, how he felt that he was getting up. And he was. But, I mean, 11 straight unanswered shots. I don't blame the ref one bit for stepping in in that matchup. Triple C is now retired, as you said. That's what he says. But, Harvey, you, you think that he's not. You think he's coming back. Yeah, you know, he's still a young athlete. and He's still an insane athlete. And he said, you know, after the fight, he does want to stay retired, but money talks. And I think he will be back. He's just got that personality where he wants to be in the news, where he wants to make headlines, and he's not going to be able to do that if he's retired. So I'm either predicting a return to the UFC after a short retirement, or heck, he might even join another company, maybe the WWE. He did have talks with them two years ago. Those did fall through uh, because, you know, he did want to go and continue his domination in the UFC. Um, but Henry Cejudo, one of the greatest fighters ever, destroying, oh, not destroying, but, you know, defeating Dominic Cruz, who was considered up to this point the greatest bantamweight ever, taken four years off due to his injury in his last fight um, against, let me, double check who that was ago Cody um Gabranda in uh, 2016 you know four years off for any athlete is just a remarkable amount of time off you're never going to be able to be as good as you once were from those four years pre uh, prior so I was very impressed with his showing here tonight but of course Cahudo came out one he is an absolutely dominating champion and I do expect a return from him in either the UFC or a debut in professional wrestling within the next few years. And here's a question for both of you. Triple C, he now sits at 16-2 and two on his career. He has lost twice, but the big quote was he called himself the best combat sports athlete ever. Ever. Ian, I mean, that's a big statement to say. Harvey, you're shaking your head. We'll get to you right after Ian. But what do you think? I mean, I bet this guy is a solid guy in person, but as Harvey mentioned, you know, this guy is an entertainer. He wants the quotes. He wants the headlines. I mean, you have the biggest, one of the biggest wins of your career and you retire after that, you're grabbing headlines. And as Harvey mentioned, he can unretire just like that. And that can mean absolutely nothing, but he wants the headlines. I mean, Harvey, I mean, is more of the expert here. And he, he, I mean, he was pretty much, you know, disgusted at what you just said. I mean, obviously, I mean, 16 wins, I mean, 16 and two, that's a great ratio. And to be honest, I'm not sure, you know, the level of competition he's fought has probably been terrific. And Cruz is another terrific fighter. I mean, the best bantamweight fighter really of all time and a future Hall of Famer. But, you know, I mean, I was not aware really of Cahuto much before this fight. And, you know, to be the top of the top of your profession, you know, regardless of if people are fans of you or not, people got to know who you are. So, you know, as much as a great fighter he is and a technician that he is and a great personality that he is, you know, he's like making weird movements with his mouth and he's like screaming before a fight. He's a great entertainer. He'd probably be great in the WWE. He's not the best combat athlete of all time. I mean, he's one of the best, you know, ESPN ranked him third heading into the fight, you know, at this moment, he's one of the best of his era, but he's not the best of all time. I mean, that was just silly to say. It was kind of a silly, uh, you know, I mean, he, he destroyed, he didn't destroy Cruz. He was great against Cruz, but his, his antics were a little bit silly. And that was kind of like the icing on the cake. <laughs> and Harvey, let's go to you. What are your thoughts on this quote? You know, he's, he, he is a great athlete, as we, as we said, but there's been so many amazing athletes to step through the UFC to call yourself the best it's just ridiculous when you have people currently in there like Daniel Cormier and Steve Miocic, you know, and Khabib for crying out loud that you just can't call yourself the best, especially when you're 16 and two and the light heavyweight champion is 26 or 28 and oh, you can't call yourself the best when there's another better undefeated athlete in the same company as you. And if you look 
to the years prior when UFC was just starting out and you had people like Dan Severin or Roy Gracie. Those were amazing athletes. Dan Severin having over 100 UFC fights. Same with Ken Shamrock. These are people who are, who are fighting multiple fights in a night. You know, 20, you know, 20, 30 years ago, those people were probably better athletes and were better fighters than Cahuto. Try and get Cahuto to fight multiple times in a night. No, you're seeing these people fight multiple times a year. So to call himself the best was just absolutely ridiculous. I do think I have to agree with both of you guys. Uh, he is great, definitely not the best. It's very interesting, you know, calling yourself the best when there's been a history of UFC, it's a big statement to make. A lot of people didn't agree. And now he stays retired. We'll see what his next move will be. Now let's get to the main event, our favorite match of the night, Ian, and the fight of the night, according to uh, UFC president Dana White, Justin Gaethje versus Tony Ferguson. It was a battle all the way through all five rounds. I mean, Gaethje just kept throwing bombs. Ferguson was taking him on the chin. It seemed like he had an iron chin. Mm -hmm. He took, what was it, 100-something uh, hits, Ian? What was the 136 punches and kicks from Justin Gaethje. I mean, this was insane. I mean, Dylan, we were expecting Gaethje to throw bomb after bomb before the fight. I mean, Ferguson held up pretty well, considering all oh, 136, and he's still standing. He never felt once. But, you know, I was just – I fell in love with Justin Gaethje from, from the get-go. I mean, I know you were a big Tony Ferguson guy, Dylan, with the iron chin, and he wins with his stamina and his grit, and, you know, he just won't go down in a five-round fight. I mean, the fact that he lasted all five rounds, even though his face was absolutely destroyed, it was battered. I mean, it was insane how long he lasted. But I just fell in love with Gaethje, even though he was, you know, not the, uh, not the cleanest fighter with his wins and losses in the past, just because, you know, he's a guy you can root for, even if I'm not a big fan of the sport, you know, I, I'm not a big Tony Ferguson fan because he's just not that exciting to watch in my opinion. He might be a great fighter, very skilled technician. He knows how to win. You know, he's spinning around, he's doing things fighters can't, other fighters can't do with their body. He moved very well. He was very agile, but I can just get behind the guy who whenever he punches, it's over. You know, like those punches are highlight reel, slow-mo, but, you know, absolutely out of these world hits. The fact that Tony Ferguson is, you know, still, you know, cognizant and walking, talking today is pretty insane after Justin Gaethje did that to him. You know, this was the interim lightweight championship after the fight when Joe Rogan interviewed Gaethje. He just dropped the belt and said, I'm waiting for Khabib. You know, I don't care if he beats Khabib, probably won't beat Khabib. Khabib's never been beaten, but it will be an epic fight to watch regardless because whenever Gaethje lands a shot, it's going to be a highlight reel shot. That's just what he does. He, you know, he's a highlight real guy, and I can get behind a guy like Justin Gaethje. This was an epic fight, and I loved every second of it. It was an amazing fight. You know, I want to talk more about Tony Ferguson. He took so many hits. But, Harvey, as our analyst, we know Tony Ferguson as a submission expert. He lasts through five rounds. He has incredible stamina, but he didn't take him to the ground once. What was the deal with that? He wanted to stand up and go uh, hit for hit with Justin Gaethje, a guy who's called a human highlight reel, who throws bombs left and right. What was his strategy? Dude, I, that is a good question. What was his strategy? This, in my opinion, was a sad fight for me to watch as someone who's been following this for quite some time, who's been a, you know, a follower of Tony Ferguson. He's always able to go down on the ground, lock in that triangle choke hold and get the win. He hasn't lost in eight years and this was his first loss in eight years. Wow. So you have to think that his crew, the people behind him decided, hey, let's try and change up your game plan to go against um, your opponent and see if that, you know, would come out and with a win. And obviously, it, he didn't change it well enough. You know, he, he seemed more human in this fight than I've ever seen him, which is crazy because he didn't fall down to the ground. He was more, inhu uh, more human was being inhuman, if that makes any sense. Uh, but he just wasn't, he wasn't putting up as big as a fight as he has in his previous fights. You know, someone who's beaten uh, Donald Cherone, uh, you know, uh, he's beaten you know, some great, great athletes. He's a former interim light uh, heavyweight champion himself. Just to see him not even kind of attempt for any submission, something that he's been great at, uh, it made me very upset. It made me very sad. Um, I don't know if he's going to fight again. I personally don't want to see Tony fight for a while. Something is going on. Um, either they just need to change his game plan back or he's injured and we don't know. He's not able to go for those submissions. Something was up. This was not the Tony Ferguson that we've seen for the last undefeated eight years. 
But um, I was still impressed with the fight that he was able to put up, not falling to the ground once, as he keeps saying, something most UFC fighters will not be able to do. Uh, but yeah, I, I personally was kind of upset with what was happening. And it was interesting because actually uh, Tony Ferguson came in on a 12-0 and win streak, as you said, and I didn't see anyone really take the uh, opponent to the ground all night through the five fights. A question that really came to mind was, do you think this pandemic had any thoughts into these minds fighters that maybe they don't want to go to the ground? Maybe they want to stay up? Yes, it's a contact sport, and they were fighting, fighting each other all night. The virus could go anywhere, as anyone knows. But do you think there was maybe a thought in the back of the minds of the fighters that maybe they don't want to go to the ground? Maybe they don't want to go down on that mat? Honestly, Dylan, that is that was very smart of you to say. And yeah, that probably did play. Either they were thinking, like if they were thinking it or not, it had to be in their subconscious that they knew if they were grabbing each other and wrestling around, like you do see in a lot of UFC fights, that's a lot of bodily fluids that you are passing. And that is a lot like a uh, like higher likelihood that you will contract the virus, you know, especially when one of your fighters did uh, test positive uh so that could have definitely played a role in tony you know he's kind of he's getting older you know for a ufc fighter he was probably a bit worried about that uh and mate, that's a great call on you dylan oh thank you Harv. we have a few more things that we want to go over uh ian you touched on it that gaichi might be fighting khabib next we'll see what dana white has to say khabib is a submission tech submission specialist i should say gaichi a guy who's like to stay on his feet hopefully we get that fight and it'll be a combination of two different strategies going back to back. But I want to get to that one last topic, and it's a topic that everyone wants to talk about. When is Conor McGregor uh, fighting next, and who should he fight? In my mind, Harvey, you know, I want to see that third trilogy with Nate Diaz. Is that a possibility, or maybe you should fight someone else? What are your thoughts? Oh, I. So uh, last we saw of Nate Diaz, you know, he lost to Jorge Masvidal in the uh, BMF uh, Championship fight. Uh, I, I'm not really sure on the current status of Nate. I don't really think he wants to fight at the moment, especially during an ongoing pandemic. Um, as much as that would be an amazing fight against Conor uh, McGregor, I think McGregor has moved on and I think he's ready for new opponents, You know, especially after that absolute domination against Donald Sharon. I think he's looking towards a, another Khabib-McGregor fight, which would be big money fight again. But you have to think, what about a um what about a Gaethy Khabib fight? You know, that you know, you have your interim champion versus the champion. That's gotta be the next fight instead of you know whatever Conor McGregor has to do. Uh, you know, that that that's just my thought. I mean McGregor's the money grab, but you gotta give the interim champion his his chance at a championship fight with Khabib. Yes, it might be uh, a blowout, but anyone knows, you know, we said one fight can change uh one punch could change a fight in one second. We saw it last night with Naganu and um, his opponent. Ian, you wanted to touch in on that topic. Well, I mean, again, with, you know, uh, Ngannou, I mean, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen, greatest 20 seconds I've seen in a while. But just to touch on, you know, Ferguson one more time and in, in, in what this fight could have been. I mean, imagine if Khabib fought Ferguson last night. I mean, what would have happened? I mean, if Justin Gaethje was able to do this to Tony Ferguson, and really, Ferguson only had one good shot all night. He had a, an uppercut at the end of the second, which we all thought, hey, is he getting back in it? He didn't do anything else really spectacular on the offensive end all night. But imagine if Khabib was in here with Ferguson. I mean, at the end of the fight, Ferguson, in the post-game interview of Joe Rogan, thanked, uh, thanked Justin for doing this fight. He's like, thanks for stepping in. I'm like, thanks for stepping in. He, he stepped in all right. I mean... You know, I mean, imagine if, if, imagine if he didn't step in. I mean, he probably saved Tony Ferguson from, you know, what would have happened with, uh, with Khabib. I mean, obviously, I would love to see. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, even if Justin uh, Gaethje doesn't stand much of a chance against Khabib, who nobody ever stands a chance against Khabib, really, at 28-0, it will still be a fun fight just because of the nature, you know, that Justin Gaethje brings to a fight. Any fight you put Gaethje in is going to be a fun fight to watch because he's either going to be pounding some guy or they're going to be pounding each other until somebody goes down or somebody like Khabib puts him in submission. So I want to see Gaethje versus Khabib, even if I know Khabib is going to win from the outset, it's going to be a fun as heck fight. I don't care how long it lasts, you know, 20 seconds, five rounds, it will be an electric fight to watch. I think that's what deserves it, Ian. I mean, the interim champion oh, yeah. and the champion, you got to make that fight happen. And you hopefully we'll get it soon enough. He wants uh, a challenge. 
This well, has been an amazing episode. Harvey, you want to talk in one more time? Yeah, yeah, I just want to talk a bit more about the fight. You know, I'm loving the talk that we're having. Uh, we saw, you know, um, you know, with, uh, oh, we're forgetting the names, Ferguson and Gaethje, uh, you know, two different styles against each other. And if Khabib, you know, if Khabib was in there with Ferguson, we would have seen a completely different fight. That's two submission specialists against each other. But I do have to agree. I think Tony Ferguson would have absolutely just been eaten up by Khabib. But, you know, if we're going to look at next at the Khabib, maybe Khabib Gaethy fight. Gaethy took a submission specialist, an amazing submission specialist on and beat him. So you say Khabib might be able to destroy Gaethy. You know, Khabib is a submission specialist. He is a great striker, but submissions where he's at. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a very, very good fight. A very great, um, you know, mix up in styles. I, you know, I think that's what they need to look at. Interim champion versus current champion on Fight Island, whenever that may be. God, I'm excited for Fight Island. It was an exciting night last night. I'm so glad that Ian and I tuned in, and we're happy to have you along as well, Harvey, for your Beyond the Whistle uh, debut. It's been a great recap, Beyond the Whistle episode 13, our UFC 249 recap. Ian and Harvey, thank you for joining me. I've been Dylan Pescatore. Thank you, guys.